Back with another great episode. We've been talking hypertrophy. We've been talking fat loss. Now we're going to get into strength training protocols. So I guess right off the bat, tell us the difference between all these three areas we've been getting into. Yeah. So, wow, we're going back here. So first thing we talked about building muscle, then we talked about losing weight and we kind of bounced around between that. Now we're just going to talk about getting stronger. And the, the theme is let's break down what is building muscle, gaining weight, and then in this case, getting stronger. And let's go through more of a practical and then we'll follow up with next week on the nutrition aspect. But the thought is, relatively speaking, getting stronger is a term that I think is used by a lot of people, but it, it, it's got a, a blend or it's crossed over quite a bit into building muscle and or even just this association with getting stronger as a universal solution. Uh, and there's a there's a problem to overstating the value of something of getting stronger. And it's not diminishing the value of getting stronger. It just gets into this concept of it's not the universal solution to everything. And I think that's the problem. It's, oh, we'll just get them strong, right? And that, that notion there is, in a lot of ways, very limiting to the profession. And I, I want to come off in a way that's hopefully not typical Tim Karen abrasive, like you're all idiots, but... I do get frustrated with this. Yeah, I, I do. I do get. I do get pretty animated and worked up with the idea that we can just reduce down. We do to very simple carpentalized things that just getting stronger is the end all be all. Because the truth is, and this isn't trying to create artificial value or trying to think this is so much more complex and no one could do this. This is the true statement of it takes a long time to really understand the difference between what actual training should do and what anybody could just artificially create in a weight room. And if you really value what you, what you're doing as a strength coach or someone trying to improve their athletic performance in any, any rationale or reason, you have to start to break down the central thought of there is not a direct universal path for everybody. And a lot of times it's, getting a bigger perspective or getting a, a clearer vision of what is necessary and detaching from preconceived solutions that worked before or things that you just have an artificial bias towards. I think that the part is where we're looking at getting stronger is such a fun topic. It's such an important topic, but it's a specific thing or an outcome that we're trying to create with certain inputs. And the notion that there's one type of strength and usually associated with external load is also a misconception and getting stronger is increasing force output and increasing force. You know, we've talked about this multiple times in other platforms, whether it's through the membership or the books, or in, in this case, the podcast is that getting stronger is and producing more force. There's a time variant. And then there is a, another element of body weight versus external load. And then there's a final other element of, Am I increasing something that's relevant or am I just doing something that's just for maybe that short term validation or that, that ability to say I'm making some sort of progress and that might not necessarily be towards anything specific, but you know, progress is progress. And as we start to break down protocols, the one thing I want to challenge you, the listener right now to think about is what is my definition of strong? And if someone Let's say that we're in a situation where we're at a party and someone asks what we do and we say we're a strength conditioning coach or a personal trainer and they ask you to explain that, you know, typically we kind of get into this scrambling, you know, look, reminiscent of office space. I'm a people person. I work with people, you know, that kind of explanation and they'll find whatever analogy or metaphor makes sense for them. Right. So you just get them stronger. Right. Yeah. In a simplistic way, I do. And then that gets into a forming of a definition of, okay, well, it's all you do is just get people stronger. And then it gets into this, you're typecasted. And as we start to break down what our jobs are, we, we get outcomes through having a plethora of solutions that we can plug and play. And then not only putting those ex solutions in there, executing on those solutions. And that could include some variant of getting stronger. But it also can look at it from psychological aspect or looking at it from other physiological parameters like work capacity or rate of force development or even just certain things like increasing metabolic health or efficiency. There's 
a whole host of things that can improve performance or get you to some sort of outcome. But bottom line, when we start to, you know, get into this like narrative and I'm kind of getting very, very high level and just talking and not really relevant to the question, but I think it's important for context because it's one of those like topics that can get so off track and can get so riddled with bias and personal preference or agenda. I, I've, I'm almost doing a disclaimer or a, hey, let's let's avoid the trappings that we're going to get into, right? Because then we're no different than the compilers out there that are just cherry picking data points or using references from other stuff that, quite frankly, are a bastardization of what we do, right? Like it's all about just getting stronger. They just put them on a leg press and a lat pull down and say, just do that three sets of ten, one to two times a week, and you'll be fine. You're right. You'll you'll diminish the diminish the decay of the body and muscle mass and bone mineral density. And that's it. That's all you need to do. Like, I, I wish it was that simple. It's just not. And I'm not trying to overly, overly complicate our profession. But the truth is, is there's a very small fraction of the people in the world can actually do this at a high level. And the fact that most people don't have the ability to discern between elite versus some just Reddit user or someone just listened to a podcast who figured out they mastered the secrets to training in the universe. I find that disappointing and, and hopefully this platform, this podcast is a way to differentiate. And if I'm good at what I'm doing, I can explain what I do simply, but also to the people that know that work with me, know that there's nothing simple about what I do. So I guess that leads to right into this next part is just, we should define what getting stronger is. Yeah. So there's force and then there's a time variant of force that we need to talk about. So force just how much force can you produce, right? And sometimes it's expressed through Newton, sometimes it's expressed through external load. And if someone could back squat more, you can, in theory, say they are producing more force. Now, a lot of times with compound movements, so compound movement is utilizing multiple joints in a closed kinetic chain environment, so feet on the ground, we have to adjust the body to accommodate where that load sits. and in a back squat, for instance, the load is behind us and we balance ourselves by pushing our hips back and we drop our chest. This is just a natural way to do it. And there's obviously techniques that support more external load. And then there's others that are using a back squat as a means to progress something else like snatch and clean. But the thought is if we're using external load as a means to determine if producing more force, in truth, we're not probably producing more force, we're just becoming more efficient or organizing our way ourselves to get more external load lifted. And there's a fundamental aspect to technique is a really hard thing to standardize in terms of producing force through compound movements. Technique is a really hard thing to hold quality control when we get to threshold and using that as a proxy to say if we're producing more force. What is far superior is simply just looking at a force plate analysis and maybe something like a jump or isometric thigh pull. Obviously, not everyone has the ability to have that. Fortunately, there's our dynamometers that people can just get fairly cheaply and see how much force they can produce in a mid thigh pull by just a simple apparatus of attaching a chain. But let's say that you don't want to go that length. You are just a simple guy training in your garage three, four days a week. You don't want to go the length of that. External load is probably your best bet. But there's another way to look at that and the rate of force development. So there's this idea of force and velocity have this inverse relationship that the heavier something is the slower it really becomes and the lighter it is the faster we can we can move it so when we think about force and velocity it has this parabolic curve that kind of goes down so the heavier it gets the slower it gets and the faster it gets the lighter it has to be but the other notion is moving that chart to the right and we can create force velocity curves at specific intensity of external load. So instead of trying to push external load up, we can start to think about improving the rate of force development at specific load. So say 90% of your 100 kilo back squat max, you're moving at 0.23 meters per second, which is pretty slow. Maybe the next time you do it, you can get it up to 0.3 meters per second. And you didn't increase external load, you used to improve the rate of force development. And again, that could come in a, clo in a compound closed kinetic chain exercise in the form of compensation or adjusting center of mass or range of motion. But the other note, it's another 
thing to look at. And again, going back to force plates and isomid dipole, you can see that spike and the slope of that peak force. So if that peak force jumps up to 3,000 newtons, which is a tremendous amount of force on an isomid dipole. And for the record, don't use straps. You know, let's let's just do this the, the way that our forefathers would have done it, right? You know, the I find straps are. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, we don't have straps in nature. So yeah. one could argue we don't have we don't have force plates in nature, but you know, that's that's my that's like my hot take on it. But it is funny, I got called out like that seems like art like a really low force output. I'm like, oh, because you're cheating because you use straps. He's like, I didn't know I was cheating. I was going off with the standards and standard operating procedures I got from the force plate I was using. I'm like, yeah, they also call a a, a hop a jump. Like, get out of here, right? Yeah, exactly. Know your nomenclature. Let's get this straight, you know? So, and then note of that, though, let's say I produce 3,000 Newton force and it takes me 0.5 seconds to get there versus someone can get there in 0.3. You know, the, the person that can get there in a fraction of the time is producing force at a more rapid level. In theory, that's a adaptation that should translate to a lot of things, specifically team sports. So there is that element of how much force you can produce without time as a variable, and then how much force I can produce, relatively speaking, the time. There's both of those avenues. And we'll, we'll get into the difference between absolute and relative strength protocols here. But when we're thinking about, we're always hitting this like diminishing returns point, meaning that when we do something for an extended period of time, eventually it stops being as as much progress as we would like to see, or we actually start to decline. You know, what is our, what is our actual limit that we have left within that thing that we're trying to develop? Or is it a matter of, I just need to look elsewhere and develop other aspects like rate of force development instead of just pure external load. And that, that would be the way we start, want to start thinking about this conceptually is, is truth be told, getting stronger is producing more force. But when we're looking at this from a practical standpoint, the easiest way to pra track this, and, and for the record, adaptation probably is most readily understood through increasing external load. But the hope is that's off the foundation of a standardized technique that we want to move. And we're adding load to that standardized technique. And when that standardized technique becomes amended or adjusted or compromised, that external load becomes less significant because we're no longer adapting. We're just compensating to the external load by adjusting our center of mass or our range of motion. So when we're looking at getting stronger, if the adaptation is get producing more force and we have an amendment to that, that body position, that angle, the range of motion, we are no longer producing more force. We're just become, finding ways to accomplish a task of a certain weight that is a little bit more than the week before. And then we get to that threshold. It might not come in the form of increasing weight, but it might even come in the form of maybe increasing the volume at that weight, or we maybe go out to the other level of looking at the rate of force development. And that's all, another conversation to be had about that as well. And that funnels into relative strength and absolute strength. Well, that's perfect. So let's get into relative and absolute then. Yeah, absolute is, is load or force irrespective of your body mass. Relative is load or force respective to your body mass. And when we're thinking about absolute load, it is mass moves mass. So there's a cross-sectional muscle area adaptation that we want to look at. So we look at the, the middle of a muscle belt. Let's just say this is my quad. We cut it in half here. So if you're listening to this, just imagine that I'm making a circle of my quad. So we have a cross-sectional area. In the middle, there's a femur, and then there's muscle around, quad on top, hamstring on bottom. The idea with that cross-sectional muscle area is we expand outward, right? And we talked about it with hypertrophy, the difference between functional and non-functional, myofibril. The more myofibril sarcomeres we have, the greater the contractile force we can produce, right? No matter what the research is looking at in terms of force output, there's always a, a adaptation of increased cross-sectional muscle area to produce more force. So when we're thinking about the best absolute strength athletes in the world, power lifter, strong man, I would even throw sumo into there as well. They have incredible large body masses and their cross-sectional area is massive, right? Their adaptation to that is producing more contractile tissue to overcome whatever the external load is. 
And then there's some body mass thing too, if we're lifting, if your body mass isn't really part of the equation, then, you know, we can lift a lot more weight. And then the other end of it is a neuromuscular adaptation that when we look at, all right, there's cross-sectional muscle area. How much muscle mass do I produce? Or how much muscle mass can I get to produce more force? There's a whole nother neuromuscular adaptation aspect of, okay, I'm going to send an impulse to the motor unit. And that motor unit is the central processing unit for that muscle fiber or the muscle fibers and groups associated. I'm going to add in certain neuromuscular effects to, I don't know why I get these like weird hearts coming up there. It's so odd. I don't know what Apple feature is doing that. Sorry for the, the watchers there, but they just a bunch of hearts came up. But imagine in the notion that I am sending greater impulses that goes to the motor unit, that motor unit now recruits more muscle fiber and I organize those muscle fibers more efficiently. I have a whole different adaptation that doesn't necessarily have this easy to quantify thing, but it's happening. And we know it's happening because certain loads don't feel as heavy as they used to. We get potentiated when we go through a workout. So those are more of an acute neuromuscular adaptation. We have greater responses to certain loads, meaning in the form of less delayed onset muscle soreness. So we're just distributing that force across more muscle fibers and muscle groups than we were before. There's a whole other aspect from the reflexes of the the actual Golgi tendon organ, which responds to muscle tension, and the muscle spindle, which responds to muscle stretch. And this idea of reciprocal inhibitions in the antagonist muscle group doesn't necessarily limit stuff as much as it, it once did. But the whole premise is we're creating essentially two adaptations when we do take away this time variant or when we're looking at anything other than just absolute load. Now, in terms of relative strength, there's a, there's always the the component here. Let's just use pull-ups as an example. There's, I can get stronger, which is always an important thing, right? That's the, that's the central theme of what we're talking about. And that comes again from increasing cross-sectional muscle area, as well as increasing neuromuscular adaptations. But there's a whole nother component of body composition. And, you know, that if someone's like, I can't do a pull-up, I have a dream of doing a pull-up, and they weigh 300 pounds and they're 25% body fat, it's not getting stronger is going to be the limiting factor. It's just not. They just have a lot of excess body mass in the form of adipose tissue that they're carrying around. So them increasing their relative strength is going to probably be more associated with improving their body composition and that notion there. But again, they've gotten quote unquote stronger, right? A person that could not do a pull-up before, but now can do a pull-up and they've lost, let's just say 60 pounds and 15% body fat. And now they can knock out five body weight pull-ups, you know, in theory, if they could do five pull-ups with 300 pounds and now they can do five pull-ups at a 200 pounds, the person at 300 pounds is stronger, but the problem is that person at 300 pounds can't do a pull-up and the person at 200 pounds can. So there's a, there's a weird classification here that we just made that person more efficient and better equipped to, to, to exert relative strength. Uh, their absolute strength in probably all reality has gone down, but the relative strength has gone up significantly. So when we're breaking up these two camps of getting stronger in protocols, you know, we want to think about absolute strength is just pure, get them strong. Don't worry about any of the other details, right? Offensive linemen in football, sumo wrestlers, strong men, power lifters, and then relative strength of I need to be cognizant of their body mass and their body composition and then producing a tremendous amount of force. And if you ask me what's the superior one, it's hands down relative strength any day of the week, even for people whose body mass can be extremely high because the person that can move more bo- more external load relative to one's body mass will always be superior than the other. But the notion of there's going to be a time and a place for either. So we talk about these protocols. So going through those two camps. <laughs> Sorry about that. So unpacked a lot there, neuromuscular adaptations, all, all sorts of different things, rate coding. So I guess the big thing to dive into now is like, what are the protocols and how can we get those adaptations? Yeah. So thinking about absolute strength, it's about how much pure intensity and volume at that intensity can we accrue? So quick, easy sets and reps, the higher the sets, the less number of reps and the same thing for volume and and intensity, the higher the intensity, the less volume. 
And when we're trying to create strength, regardless of body mass, there is going to be that neuromuscular. And as we talked about the cross-sectional area, there's probably a case to be made about a microcycle or training session design here. But when we're getting into the protocol aspect, you know, you really got to look at what's the limiting factor here. Does that person not have a lot of lean muscle mass on them? Can we increase that cross section muscle area? Or does that person just have poor neuromuscular adaptations? And, you know, the thought is we can do a good inventory of what that person needs and we can start to look at what is the biggest limiting factor. Because that's what I was talking about before. A good coach can determine what is needed and where they can bring value quicker than someone who's just going to grasp at whatever means is easier to understand or maybe even more preferenced. So if I'm looking at a athlete and they're 300 pounds and 30% body fat and they want to increase their absolute strength, I'm probably going to think about increasing the lean muscle mass and maybe even decreasing their fat mass because just they're not efficient. It'll say that they are 300 pounds and they're at 12% body fat, which is possible. And I've had them before. It might actually come from more neuromuscular because Quite frankly, their body mass is at adequate level. Their body composition is extremely, extremely elite. So the neuromuscular adaptations come through there. So when we're thinking about the neuromuscular, it's going to go into high set, low rep, high intensity, right? So if you want me to say that differently, high intensity to start, no matter what, 90% and above of your one RM, one rep to two reps in reserve left in the tank for pretty much any set that you're doing or working towards threshold as close as you can almost every set. And then less volume under under 20 seconds of total time under tension. And then potentially looking at no more than five, six reps, even getting downwards to singles and doubles or ones and twos. And then the sets, like the, anytime we have a very low number of reps at a high intensity, we can't, get the tonnage or the amount of volume we need to create some sort of neuromuscular adaptation. So that gets into, we need to increase the volume through number of sets because I don't have as much of a window within that, at that intensity of time within that intensity that I can actually create stress. So if that's going to be under 20 seconds and I can only do 20 seconds at a given part or three to six reps, then I'm going to have to break that up now with more sets so I can get that adaptation at a higher level. And that might get upwards to six, eight, people who know me, I can get up to 10, even 20 sets and a certain thing. And that's a philosophical thing as well. I definitely have, I adhere to find out what we need to do and then do that at a violently, violently high amount and level. I, I don't sugarcoat, I don't like to play guessing games. I'm not, I'm not trying to distribute stuff because I'm unsure or unaware of what I need to do. That's. That's something that I pride myself on of bet big and get big results. So the folks out there are like, oh, man, 10 sets is a lot. Yeah, if you don't know what you're doing. Yeah, I would not do that if you have a very vague understanding of what that person needs. But when you do and you can inventory what that person needs quickly and identify what's going to bring the most value, it's not that hard. But then on the other end, if I need to improve that person's cross-sectional area, Essentially, we're just dropping the sets, increasing the volume, the time and attention to 20 to 40 seconds per per set. And then we're potentially looking at like a maybe a 75 to 85 percent intensity. And then the rep ranges is like anywhere from, I would say, again, three, but maybe allocating a little bit more time and attention eccentrically, isometrically, and then breaking that out into upwards into this eight rep range. But the idea here is I'm zeroing in on what the limiting factor for producing more absolute strength is. And then I'm saying, if it's neuromuscular, I'm going to do higher intensity, less reps, more sets. If it's on the other end, I need to increase cross-sectional muscle area. It's going to be a little bit longer time on attention, a little less number of sets, and then more of a moderate to high intensity to get that outcome. And there's a, like I said, at the beginning of this little, little rant here, the, the general thought would be, that's an isolation. How does that integrate into a training session? There are means that work all these things simultaneously, like a mixed method, sometimes referred to as conjugate of working power, strength, and then some sort of volume or hypertrophy. But on the other end, you could break that up into a microcycle or training week. I maybe have a day allocated towards strength and maybe a day allocated towards uh, power, maybe a day allocated towards hypertrophy or muscular endurance. You know, and those are the thoughts that we start to break out. I'm, I'm 
I'm trying to simplify and distill this down to at its raw, most fundamental level, what we're thinking about doing, but there's a whole other conversation to be had about how that org that, how that impacts a training cycle and your overall training plan. Yeah. One thing, uh, an analogy that you say a lot is like, if I know the roulette wheel is going to stop on black, why would I not put everything on black? So it's that idea of like, yeah, you can go mix, but that, that bet big win big approach. I, I, I love, and it just shows how deep in the weeds we could really get. Yeah. One thing I wanted yeah. to touch on was a rest component. Cause if you've never done a have 10 heavy sets, there's definitely a rest component. So could you dive into that for a bit? Yeah. Density. So we're thinking about volume or tonnage in a training session, which is volume and intensity. The rest has a also inverse relationship to it, right? So the higher the intensity, the longer the rest, but more along the lines of more thinking density, volume or reps per set has an inverse relationship between uh, or a, a inverse relationship between rest, right? So ironically, higher volumes, because you might think oh, I'm going longer, I need more rest. We're tapping into less of this neuromuscular aspect. We need actually less rest because it's more muscular and metabolic. And the muscular system and the metabolic system recover faster than the neuromuscular system. The neuromuscular system takes upwards of six to 10 times the amount as a metabolic system and the muscular system will recover. So we have higher volumes. We actually need less rest. When we have higher intensity, it's not the cardiovascular or the respiratory system that's the limiting factor. It's the CNS or the central nervous system that's the limiting factor. So we need more rest. So in effect, the density is massively less if I'm trying to work neuromuscular adaptation. So if I'm doing a set of three at 90%, which is three RM pretty much on most RM scales, you're going to need at least 10 times the amount of recovery to get that. So you might see a set of three with a 3.0 exo tempo, that's a nine second per set, need two minutes to three minutes of recovery. That's a long time to rest for a very short bout. And you see people get stir crazy and anxious, but that's when we see diminishing returns with the value from that set and compromised position and range of motion start to creep up or rate of force development start to slow down. And we could you know, rise and overcome, but the truth is, is the rest component here is a huge piece of it. And if we're working more volume, you need less rest because that's the goal. It's to create some sort of muscular metabolic adaptation by adjusting rest periods to a higher work workout, work output per set. Sorry, I lost you there for a second, but I'm, I'm back. So this has been, are... <laughs> this has been a great one, Tim, a lot to unpack. We got deep into the weeds and strength, and then we got into those specific protocols. So hopefully for those listeners, they got something out of it and they grabbed their pen and paper and they're ready to go to get stronger. Yeah. Yeah. It is a, it's a great topic. So I'm fired up to be able to do this. We'll talk about nutrition here next week. All right. Sweet. See you then. Thanks, Tim. Thank you, buddy.